Hello there, YouTube and makers, and thank you for joining me today on another installment of my make of the Kozo Hiroka Pennsylvania A3 Switcher Steam Locomotive Engine in a 040 layout in three quarter inch scale that will run hopefully here sooner rather than later on a three and a half inch gauge track. I'll be featuring another journeyman trick of the day so that you never miss another journeyman tip or trick of the day as well as a future installments of my make of Kozu steam locomotive engine be sure to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification so you know when that video posts for a little bit of the housekeeping in this first part you're going to see on my arbor which holds these tender wheels a little a drawn on with permanent marker. I'm not clear if I had mentioned that in my previous video, but before removing my arbor from the chuck, I made sure to draw a permanent marker and A pointed at the center of the A jaw on the chuck so that when I reinserted my arbor in between uh, efforts to machine this, these tender wheels, I would roughly have be close to the same alignment I had initially made the arbor on to help me get it dialed in. And I'll be using a stair last word dial indicator. If I did not have that dial indicator, that A would still be useful in helping me get alignment. And then what I would do is, as, as you can see in my arbor, I made it much bigger and beefier than that was called for and that they needed to be. So that because I have a non-adjustable three-jaw chuck, and if I didn't have a dial indicator, I would basically take a skim cut off the face of the shoulder of that arbor so that every time I put in another tender wheel, whenever I had a break, long iteration and had to reload the arbor in, it would run true. With all of that as a framework of where we're coming from for this installment, I have to say, I'm really kind of looking forward to this part of it because I think unlike any other part any person who look at that and be like okay that's a train wheel so I'm looking I'm really looking forward I'm really jazzed to doing this and to getting this part done because I will finally have something that unlike maybe some other parts that'll be there will be coming along here fairly quickly will look like a train part will look like a piece to our Kozo Hiroka Pensi A3 Switcher Steam Locomotive. So I wanted, I really want to share this with you. I'm glad to have you here to be able to share this with you. So come on over here and join me at the bench and let's make some chips. My dial indicator, I'm just going to check it out real quick to make sure that my arbor is running true. And as you can see, it is. I'm, it's barely moving, it's less than a dial brought up. I'm going to bring in my cutter against the shoulder of the arbor. And then on my uh, lead screw hand wheel, I'm going to back off 150 thousandths. Because those directions only call for between 93 and roughly 94 thousandths of a tread flange thickness. So I'm going to give myself plenty of meat. Now, I wanted to point out this that because I don't know what kind it is. I haven't been able to find one. And it's got this fantastic round flat on it that is just absolutely dead flat and has been great for cinching up the tender wheels against the arbor base and really getting them to run true. I want to bring a point that I don't want to over tighten because I have made mistakes in which have caused the arbor to turn and that requires remachining the arbor down. So, Take it easy, don't overdo it. I'm going to take a real light skim cut to kind of index where I'm at. I'm just going about 10,000 this first time. Feeling good, so I'm going to vary my cuts anywhere from 10, 15 thousandths. They're doing a good job and I'm listening to the way the machine sounds, I'm feeling how vibrations are transferred through the hand wheels, and kind of judging how much to take off. My Real quick rough measure shows I've got 
110 left, so that's good. And I'm gonna start to go in. This time, it's at about 15,000. I'm gonna keep it at 10,000 turns so I can keep better track of how quickly and how much material I'm moving. Make sure I've got plenty of lubricant, run a little bit on there each time. It's cutting well. I like the way these, the finishes are looking. They seem really shiny. Oops, a little boo boo there. Didn't take it all the way, but hey, it's a learning process. So I'm gonna, right here, I didn't go any further in. I just took a real light pressure cut. And now I'm gonna take an accurate measuring to judge where I'm at. I'm gonna give my material about 10 minutes to cool off to address any issues caused by heat expansion from the friction of the previous cutting intervals and do a real quick measurement. I'm within a thou, my last measurement, so that's good. Dab of cutting fluid on there. And I'm just gonna touch off, re-zero my hand wheel so it's a little bit easier to track on how much more to remove from the radius. Taking off about 10 thou, I think, here. And then I'm gonna take a pressure cut and the pressure cut um, is the same exact measurement as the previous cut, but it is removing material that may still be there because of deflection caught in the cutter or deflection in the arbor. Uh, get it nice and clean, remove any chips so I can get a good, accurate measurement. Seeing that it's not too, too warm and hopefully not expanded due to friction. Only 8,000, not bad lightly knock off any burr on that flange so that it doesn't give me any false reading when I check the thickness. I've got about 150,000 left to go and Kozo's dimensions call for a flange thickness of 93 to 94 thousandths. Technically it's 0 0.09375 and I'm going to touch off on the flange here so you see I've run the cutter up to the flange and now I'm going to zero it so that it's a little bit easier for me to keep track and I know where I'm at and I don't lose myself and make too thin of a flange. Because I want to get to about where I'm at, flange thickness less than 10 thousandths and bring it in carefully that last 6 thousandths or so. Just kind of checking where I am with my cutter, make sure I clear everything. Small dab of cutting fluid, about 10 thousandths, like the way that looked. Now I'm going to go in about 40 thousandths, go for it, and see where we are. Ooh, that's insane, right? That, and that definitely does not sound cool. That is bad. That is really bad. I can't believe that I've done that again and possibly ruined another arbor. This is doing well. Had a nice arbor. It reminds me of uh, that monologue by Ralphie on a movie called The Christmas Story, in which he talks about you're at the epitome and apex of your happiness and joy, and then tragedy strikes. Well, as you saw, tragedy strikes. And those of you who are keen of eye and astute observers will notice that the arbor I was using is different than the one I was using. And that's because this isn't the first time that's happened. The first time that this happened, I had to basically remachine my arbor because the galling that occurred between the wheel and the arbor was so bad that the shoulder was messed up and I had to take a skim cut off the shoulder. But in doing so, I accidentally turned, turned down the arbor shaft by making a pressure cut or a skim cut inadvertently, which reduced the arbor shaft diameter, which made a very loose fit between the tender wheel. I don't know if you can hear that come through. I mean, it was less, much less than a thousandth of an inch. But that skim cut doubled that into a diameter. It was enough to ruin the arbor. So I had to make a new one. But when that problem doesn't occur, the wheel should look like this one up above. 
And the one below, you can see the galling that occurs between the shoulder of the arbor and the tender wheel. I barely lucked out, I think, on this one. Galling almost started to occur, but not really anything to dig into the sh arbor shoulder or the tender wheel. Hopefully you can see in this picture here, there's a little ring. So blue dicum was rubbed off, but not enough that it affected the metal. Nor did it affect the metal on the shoulder on the arbor. I double checked that out. I reloaded my stare at last word indicator, ran that across the face, saw that I didn't get any bumps or no, no prop, no weird readings. Everything was running nice and true. And the other thing when this problem happens is if the wheel catches the arbor and the arbor holds, well, the arbor will be stationary, will be stationary inside the jaws of the chuck and the chuck will continue to turn which will damage the shaft body of the arbor, it could even damage the jaws of the chuck. So, lesson learned, not to be overtly ambitious, take appropriately sized cuts with appropriate speeds and feeds. But despite the problem and tragedy, it's surmountable. I don't have to make a new arbor this time around. I don't really have to machine the face. And I can kind of continue on and get back to machining. So, Come on, join me back here at the bench, and let's finish machining that flange as well as the uh, tread on the tender wheel, and let's make some chips. This is how I should have made my cuts. Just a nibble off 10,000 at a time. That 40,000 was just too much, and it's not really an issue with the Sherline lathe or the chuck or anything. It's the diameter of the arbor, and cutting fluid getting everywhere, cutting fluid being aerosolized, and being too ambitious and not giving it the proper speed and feed. You'll notice that I'm taking tiny little pressure cuts off because it's the cutter's getting a little bit too close to the tread. And leaving a little bit more meat on that tread ensures that I don't undersize the wheel. But I don't also don't want to take any too many pressure cuts because I don't want to end up accidentally work hardening the surface, making it more difficult for myself to go in there and finish machining the final um, tread diameter. So I'm taking a pressure cut here, and I'm going to, again, lightly file. I don't want to knock it back, knock off all those chips so that I can take a accurate measure of my micrometer here. Let's see where we're at. So it looks like about a good two or three thousandths left to go. So I'm going to clean it up so I have a clear view of everything and set this up and take my final cut on the tread to get it into dimension. So took the material off. I'm going to go back same setting as previously and just oh, let me reset that let's redo that get that back in position right, figure out where i'm at and then just hopefully now take a pressure cut and be done with it again lightly file i don't want to round anything just to get the burr off so i can accurate measure and take out my micrometer. Now a word on using the micrometer is that there are markings every 25 thousandths. So I'm going to read where I'm at on the barrel here. So it's going to be, so there's three lines, right? So that's 75 thousandths plus 18. So that's like 93. And then I'm going to look to see where the line matches up um, on the barrel and it looks like the best matchup isn't here it's going to be the two and the six so that tells me what my ten thousand places so my final measurement is 0 0.0936 so i'm um, six ten thousandths 
over 93,000. So that leaves me a very tiny amount. And I'm splitting 110,000 at this point, excuse me, 10,000 points. So I'm good with that. And I believe it's in the dimension. So I'm going to take a measurement of with my caliper here to find out where I'm at. So I know about how much left to take off the tread. Just going to orientate myself, check my measurements, make sure everything's still zeroed. Oh, by the way, double checking to make sure it's not warm. So let's come back to 10. I'm going to take a light cut, bring it off, bring it back to the previous settings here. Light about cutting fluid, take a pressure cut. Notice hardly anything came off. And now I'm going to again wipe it off, see where I'm at. So, last one took about 2,000 off, so I'm at about 4,000 in diameter, so I need to take another about 2,000 off of the radius. Maybe get a good amount of cutting fluid on there. You see, it's not a lot coming off, just a two thousandths cut. So, turn on there, I'm going to bring it back, and just take a pressure cut. You see, really nothing's coming off on that pressure cut, so that's good. And it's a nice finish, I like the way this looks. Yeah. See where we're at, hopefully. And, perfect. I'm right where I want to be. Not too bad, doing pretty good. Between what the book calls out for and what I'm measuring on my dial caliper, so hopefully it comes out in the picture right here. You can see that I am just within that dial line. So I'm splitting it dial. I'm in there within 10 dial of what the book calls out for and what the finished dimensions are. So I'm good with that. I'm perfectly content and happy with that. I think it's a good measurement. and. Remember, the important area to get, the most important area is good for me to get, is going to be in that transition between the flange and the tread, because I'm, all, I'm going to eventually be putting a three degree taper on this tread. The sequence called for in Kozo Hiroka's book is to machine the tread and the flange in a single operation, and then set your compound, so on a, on a traditional lathe, you would have a compound that rests upon a cross slide with a cross slide apron and it would have, has a tool holder built into it so you would do your machining, then you would set the compound angle to cut the thread, then set the compound angle to cut the tread. Well on the Sherline, being a smaller, more hand, compact handy machine, is that it requires the use of the compound slide attachment. On the sure line, the compound attachment simply cannot live in the same place as a tool holder. While on certain cuts, like the three degrees on the tread, it may be able to live on the cross slide with the tool holder when cutting the flange and having to reposition the compound attachment, it simply can't. So to me, for me, to be consistent in my machining, I wanted to have the same settings for each type of operation. I didn't want to do one wheel at a time in which I would set up my tool holder, do my tool holder work, and then have to remove it, and then to attach the compound attachment, and then cut the three degree flange, or three degrees on the, tr on the tread, then move the compound attachment to a different spot, and cut the 10 degree on the flange. So that means moving moving tool holders three times. Once, once for the tool holder for the flange and tread, then twice for the compound attachment. My router for machining the tender wheels was to do all the flanges and the treads at once, then do the 10 degrees on the, so well you can see it here, do all of the 
treads and flanges. Then on the reverse side, machine the back of the flange 10 degrees. And then machine the tread and flange. One thing I would like to add is that while machining the wheel wells, so here's a wheel well only. I was at first having some difficulty in which I was trying to get the wheel wells perfect. I eventually came to the realization that there can be a front and a back to the wheel wells. And the perfect uh, wheel well can be on the front where it's always going to be seen. And the not so perfect wheel well can be on the back. And when I came to that realization that I had two chances to make a perfect wheel well, I was able to relax and I was more confident in the cuts I made. I was more productive in the cuts I made and my finish on the cuts vastly improved. Marking up my tender wheels with the flange height after picking my best wheel well to show out was something that helped me a lot. And it's something that I would definitely do in the future. As previously mentioned, I've already described my back flange height of 0.1875. And I'm checking by touching off with the cutter and seeing that it does line up with the lines I described. So I'm happy with those calculations. Correct. And I'm going to cut how about half the flange. Really here it looks like a point three quarters just to kind of make it a relief cut. And I'm going to cut the rest of the flange height of 10 degrees on the back side. Which I realize now in hindsight wasn't necessarily to break it up because it's going to get filed anyways and rounded. But here's a view that's set up for cutting the tread. And as you can see the compound slide attachment uh, measures degrees in two degree increments. So I'm just going to take some time right now to zero my hand wheel, to zero the compound slide, and futz with it and see that I got everything clear, that my table's not going to run into my workpiece, and that everything's all set up so that when I apply sloppily all this blue dicum in order to see where I've machined and that I've gotten into that corner between the flange and the tread that I'm going to be able to cut all my tapers and it's looking good everything lines up and seeing if the wheel moves the proper position with the tread and the flange machined it's time to put our tapers onto the tender wheels the book calls for, and it is totally useful to use blue dichem to coat the flange as well as the tread. So you can see where I'm at and see where it's machining. Get my compound and cutter right in that corner where the tread and flange meet and machine the three degrees on the tread and then the 10 degrees on the flange. Blue dichem is in a love-hate relationship. Applying it, I've never applied it very evenly. It's gotten blotchy, it's pooled and gotten drippy, thick spots that were dark, and it was thin in others. So seeing my layout lines has been kind of a challenge because it's inconsistent. And you know, the layout line will be clear on one side, but then it'll be kind of hard to see on the other. And of course, my part is turning, so it's like the these layout lines appear and disappear with the uneven application blue dicum. Then I gotta clean the blue dicum off because it pools and dry. And then if I don't apply it neatly, it's it gets to drip and you have these thick spots that take forever to dry because if you were to run this machine at full speed and you have wet blue dicum, in a stripe, I got a stripe going down from my forehead, down my chest, and then a stripe blue dicum going all the way up to the ceiling and into the light fixture. It's a mess. And there's what can you do to apply it neatly and to do a good job so that these layout lines are actually useful? Well, 
that brings us to the journeyman trick of the day. And when the journey machinist taught me about how to apply the blue dica, the way they do it in the job, it made the difference. It made a huge difference. The layout lines were clear, um, it reduced the mess, I reduced drippiness and waste of blue dica, and all my part coatings were consistent. So they actually helped a lot. It, this next trick, journeyman trick, is, seems super simple, but it makes a huge difference when it, when doing the layout work and with good layout lines it means that i can do better machining and be confident in the cuts i make are within dimension but of course good blue dicom adhesion begins with a clean part in my personal preference and my tool of choice for preparing my parts to take blue dicom are right, just simple over-the-counter blue shop towels and a dab of acetone or and of course or whatever solvent I happen to have on hand my gores always working in a well-ventilated room and area as well as wearing my safety gloves so let's get on to it and let's see what that journeyman trick of the day looks like and so that you never miss a future journeyman trick of the day be sure to hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification so you never miss another helpful and super useful journeyman tips and tricks of the day. I can't emphasize enough that I want to make sure before applying the blue dicum that my workpiece is dry and clean of any cutting fluid. And of course my weapon of choice in that approach is to make sure I use uh, blue shop towels and a splash of acetone while wearing gloves of course. And I'm going to run my workpiece on at a low speed. I made the mistake of doing it at high speed. I had a blue dicum skunk, stri skunk stripe going from my forehead down my chest then up the wall and up on to the light fixture. So slow and steady. I'm just letting my lathe do the work and turn it uniformly, evenly applying it. It's just nice, and clean, and uniform, not drippy. I wish I knew this when I was doing the layout on my tender wheels. Because on a flat surface like this, it's just less drip, less mess. It's totally uniform. You can see the reflection on the lathe bed in it. So my layout lines are absolutely crisp, absolutely clear and uniform. I can see them clearly all the way around. I don't have to worry about blotchy or thin spots because the layout lines do disappear in poorly applied areas. And it just makes it so much nicer and it looks so much cleaner. It makes for better machining practice overall. Journeyman, it's a trick of the day to get a nice coating of blue dicum on. That's it. Start taking it off. You can see my initial cut was a little off. I only took about a third off when I was going for half. But then I brought the cross slide in a little too close and almost took it off all the way. I was only intending to do half. I'm lucky I didn't know. So I'm going to bring it in now to that corner between the flange and the tread and do it the way I was supposed to. So I'm going to kind of get in there and get a close look and see. There's a little bit of tread left to take off. So I'm going to bring it in really close to the flange this time. Actually scrape off a little dicum and put it in there. And now we're done with the tread. A nice three degree cut. Now, barely knock off that little bit of the burr. Nice. See if I can clean it up and no, it doesn't quite look like it, but it did remove all the I did remove all the blue dicum off that tread. And I'm happy with that. And as you can see here, here's the setup I've got for cutting the flange. And as you can see, the compound side doesn't live with the tool holder attachment. And that's one of the challenges with this setup. And one of the reasons why I went with my machine router and did everything at once so that I could more consistently get 
the same cutter position for every single wheel, the same zeros on my hand wheels without having to adjust, reset, recheck, redial everything in. So, but it does work, it gets in there to do it. So now I'm going to go in there and begin machining the 10 degrees on the flange. Again, I'm going to do about half of it, but actually that was a little more than half, so I'm going to have to bring it in and really get it into that corner there and remove to where it takes that blue die cam off and put that 10 degrees in. So, let's see how that goes. Good, it's doing it. Now I've got it. That 10 degrees machined in there. Looks nice. I think it does at least. Um, you see not a trace the blue die cam left and I didn't take off much from the tread on the flange. Before I start using my file, I'm going to clean it. So I clean my file before I use it. I clean my file in the middle of a job if it's heavy cutting. I clean my file when I'm done. So I'm going to start on the corner and use more pressure. And at the top, I'm lightening up. Again, I'm going to do the inside of the flange. More heavy pressure in the corner, roll it, and lighten up. Heavy pressure, lighten well, I got a little too much off the top. Heavy pressure, lighten. Heavy pressure on the inside and outside of the flange. Roll it and lighten up on that top radius. And I don't want to take too much off the flange. With all this trouble machining the flange, I don't want to knock it all down. But it's nice, smooth finish feeling. Again, clean my file every time. Clean that file before, during, and after. Good file leader. Now I'm going to use a stare at radius gauge to check whether or not I got it rounded. I'm using the book calls for 330 seconds width on that flange, but since it's a radius gauge, I, the radius would be 364. And I'm surprised at how perfectly round it is. It, I'm not seeing a glint of light or anything pass through, believe it or not. It is very well rounded. I'm surprised our first attempt. That went well. Little hiccup aside with, you know, the thing with the arbor. But I'm pretty happy with the way my tender wheel turned out. The flange cutting went well. The tread cutting went well. And my compound slide attachment went real well. And I felt it was very consistent. It felt very solid and it makes a really nice and really good finish. And having applied this tool over not just the one tender wheel you saw me do, but eight tender wheels. And in addition to that, I kind of took up the challenge in this time to not just do the tender wheels, but to do two additional sets of wheels. So a total of 16 more wheels plus axles plus bogies plus frames to build a couple of passenger cars because reading some of the, the uh, text by a model engineer writer such as Martin Evans and Curly Lawrence LESC is that it occurred to me that it might be a good idea that to test this thing when it eventually gets done, it would be really nice to see if it could actually pull like my weight or pull a load weight. And to do that, I would need some cars. And to be perfectly honest, once that uh, Kodo Hiroka, Pennsylvania A3 switcher locomotive is done, I'm not gonna really want to build some cars. I'm just gonna wanna get that loco going down the track and having to procrastinate and prolong things for a couple of passenger cars is not something I would really want to do. And in fact, it doesn't seem many other people would want to do that because one kind of recurring theme that happens over and over again, is they talk about these issues with 
people not finishing the tenders because they get the they get the engine done and they just don't but they haven't done the tender yet and that's the last thing to do and it is very anticlimactic to have to prolong things even more to finish that tender something i'm not too stoked about is i did take a couple thousands off the diameter of the flange um, something that kind of surprised me is how much that file to, takes off. I thought I was being careful and being very light when I got to kind of the tangent position of the the file on top of the flange. But as I saw on the video playback, that file still chews that flange down. And I could see filings just spitting off underneath. So that was something that's a little bit surprising. And my file work, I think, needs... A little my my handwork needs a little bit more practice and a little bit more refining to kind of to dial it in. So that's something I really need to kind of think about and would definitely I do want to improve. Something else that kind of came up in the the replay and seeing it on video, which I didn't even realize I might have been doing at the time, is I felt that it looked like I had a little bit of hesitation when I was using the file and the flange. And I think that hesitation is born out of the fact that I had finished cutting that three degrees on the tread of the wheel. And I was, and I remember it at the time, I was kind of concerned about not allowing the file to hit that tread. So I think in the future, what I would prefer to have done is cut the rear of the flange, cut the face of the flange, leave the tread and not cut the three degree taper on it yet, but do my file work carefully, so, but give myself a little bit of confidence and margin of error that even if I did nick or mar the tread, that I would still be coming back afterwards and cutting that three degree taper and it would likely remove any kind of damage incurred by the file and rounding off the flange. Well, that is it. That is it for machining of the tender wheels for the Kozo Hirooka Pennsylvania A3 Switcher 040 layout steam locomotive engine in 3 quarter inch scale to run on a 3.5 inch gauge track. To be fair, I have not in this episode and I will probably not immediately do my final polishing and sanding. And that's for a couple practical reasons. I'm still kind of figuring out what kind of finish I want to use. Do I want to use something like an automotive paint? Do I want to use a more modern baked on finish, high endurance paint like Cerakote, which, you know, I would have to kind of learn to do, do, do use Cerakote because I've never used Cerakote before. Or do I really want to be full on bougie and not because I can't help myself to be bougie when it comes to metal finishes sometime and do something like a color case hardening which would just be awesome or you know maybe something else like a hot blue finish or a parkerizing finish I don't know I'm still kind of de determining what I want to do and what direction I want to take these tender wheels in but I do like my fine metal finishes after all, that's why my lathe has got a jewel plate that it's attached to. Next time, I am going to be turning these two bars into axles for our Kozo Hirooka Pennsylvania A3 switcher steam locomotive engine in three quarter inch scale to run on that 3.5 inch gauge track. So. Be sure that you hit that subscribe button as well as the bell notification so that when that video posts, you don't miss a single video. And likewise, so you never miss any journeyman tips or tricks. Likewise, please also be sure to comment below as well as share the video with anyone that you think might be interested because I really like the opportunity to reach out, meet more folks, and also to interact with everyone in the comment section. If you'd like to get your own copy of Kozo Hiroka's book, be sure to check out my links below. 
as well as if you're interested in, in obtaining your own lathe or learning more about it, I've got links below that you can check it out so that you can kind of uh, see if something, it might be something that you want to acquire for your own maker shop. Thank you very much for spending your time with me and taking the time to watch my video. I hope you enjoyed it. And in the meantime, until next time, stay safe, have fun, and keep making chips.